first of all, the timing is important. I think when it comes to Chinese diplomacy, especially high stakes diplomacy, there isn't much of coincidence. I think there's always some sort of a conscious decision behind it. The timing is important because over the past few days, China's relations with Europe have been in a kind of a patchy situation after the Chinese ambassador to France in an interview, public interview, said something, a number of things that were very disparaging of Eastern European countries, essentially questioning their independence and their genuine you know, nature as, as independent nation states. So that created a lot of backlash and negative commentaries in Europe. So my sense is it made perfect sense for Xi Jinping to finally make that call to uh, Zelensky right now to say that no, 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 China still wants to be a peacemaker. And of course, he also had few, uh, f a few months ago the Global Security Initiative whereby he's trying to present China as a global peacemaking power, not just as a global economic power, but peacemaking power. So I think the timing raises some skepticism, but the big question really here is, what can China really do? Because if you look at China, their position is very, very tortured. Uh, I remember very well last year in the Munich Security Conference in Germany, on one hand, then Foreign Secretary Wang Yi of China said, we respect territorial integrity of countries. On the other hand, he refused to criticize Russia because Russia is a close ally of China. So in a way, parang ipit din ang China. So they have a very tortured position when it comes to this issue. Hmm. Richard, uh, actually, so we've been talking about China, Russia, Ukraine, yung Philippines naman. What does, uh, well, tell us, how does this uh, factor in when you when you talk about Philippine foreign relations? No, kasi the U.S. has been uh, sending weapons, China brokering peace. How about us? What does this tell you? Yeah, I mean, first of all, when it comes to the Ukraine conflict, uh, the Ukraine conflict actually inspired the type of exercises that the Philippine army did with the Americans uh, earlier this year and also during Balikatan exercises. So literally the lessons the U.S. is learning from beating the Russians via the Ukrainians, uh, patriotic resistance, they're applying those to the Philippines in an event of war, whether it's over Taiwan or whether it's over the South China Sea with China. So operationally, there are a lot of lessons being drawn. But the other thing for the Philippines is I think uh, we're also recognizing that this President Marcos Jr. is recognizing that, uh, you know, if you don't have a superpower ally and then you're confronting another superpower, you're going to be very vulnerable. So many would argue that had Ukraine been a member of NATO or had Ukraine had a major defense treaty with any other Western power, it would not have been invaded to begin with. But it got invaded precisely because it was vulnerable and ripe for picking as far as Putin's Russia's calculus was concerned. So there are a lot of lessons for the Philippines. As far as President Marcos Jr. is concerned, while he sounded, quote unquote, neutral on the uh, Ukrainian issue, he called Zelensky earlier this year and he, at least in abstract terms, expressed solidarity with the Ukrainian people without directly condemning Russia. But the Department of Foreign Affairs since last year has consistently voted in favor of Ukraine. We're the only ASEAN country, in addition to the exiled government of Myanmar, that has consistently voted in favor of Ukraine in multiple United Nations General Assembly and other, uh, other multilateral fora votes. So actually we have been solid with Ukraine as far as our voting record is concerned. All right. Um, Richard, uh, you've mentioned super ally. Do you see this as one of the reasons why President Bongo Marcos himself will visit uh, the U.S.? next week and personally talk to President Joe Biden, that's yeah. one. And number two, uh, should we really look at their presence as offensive rather than uh, defensive, the U.S., I mean? Right. Actually, we were expecting the, the visit to the White House to happen earlier, perhaps in April rather than May. But President Yoon of South Korea, who I got to know actually is a great singer. Look at the videos of him singing American Pie in the White House just the other night. Now, una siya, so medyo may traffic dyan sa White House. And the meeting has to happen earlier than later because magsisimula ng U.S. election soon, no? Now, speaking of uh, the U.S.-Philippine uh, alliance, President Marcos is going there to essentially make sure that the ETCA is an uneven kill. And when I say even kill, what do I mean by that? I think President Marcos Jr. wants to have enough of Americans in the Philippines to make the Chinese think twice about bullying the Philippines, but he doesn't want to have too many of Americans here or an aggressive version of American bases here in the Philippines to provoke China. To get that balance right will be very, very difficult. And the other important thing here is, what is the U.S. going to offer us aside from the $100, $180 million of developing some of the sites in Cagayan, Isabela, all of those nine sites under EDCA? Because I think what President Marcos Jr. wants is, as he said, we want trade, not aid. 
Are they going to offer us free trade agreement? Are they offer us good investment deals for infrastructure? And more importantly, when it comes to our geopolitical interests, are, are the Americans going to offer us good weapons, finally good weapons, modern fighter jets, modern missile systems on an affordable basis? So this is going to be a little bit uh, usapan palenque. You know? A lot of growth talks is going to happen there, yeah.